Hi, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to the Projectus uh, Facebook page. We're here today to talk about a, a, a pretty serious topic in Singapore, uh, part of our series for Archifest Singapore. Uh, we are running a series of films, and one of them is uh, What It Takes to Make a Home, uh, a documentary uh, that we are presenting uh, with support for, uh, sorry, with support with the Canadian uh, Centre for Architecture. Uh, it's a short film. It's a 30-minute film that we are having live on uh, the Projector Plus. So do check it out if you can. Uh, you, it's it's really worth. Uh, it's a, it's a bit of an exploration of uh, homelessness in LA and in Vienna, and how people are, uh, you know, relating to architecture, uh, using architecture to intervene in uh, homelessness in these cities. So it's a bit of an urban intervention uh, by architects. And today we've assembled, uh, so the, the, actually the series uh, by the Canadian Centre of Architecture is uh, first in a three-part series. Uh, the second, uh, so it's a 30-minute documentary and the second edition deals with uh, Japan and urban isolation in Japan that will be released soon. And we hope to bring that to you also. Uh, and yeah, so do do keep up with uh, the projector.sg. In the meantime, check out this link, the projector.sg slash Archifest. We do have some feature films. And also this uh, Saturday, we'll be having a free screening on the Projector Plus that will be the architecture of infinity with the Swiss Embassy. Um, so these uh, both what it takes to make a home and the architecture of infinity will be uh, on the projector plus online and in cinema we do have uh, columbus a feature film screening and uh, if you have joined us before we do have a screening of the uh the world before your feet which is almost sold out uh, about matt green walking around new york city um covering every road and every street and every park and beach. Uh, so that's something that's interesting to, to check out. Uh, but today, as I mentioned, we've assembled a, a panel uh, for to discuss homelessness in Singapore and how we can actually build a more inclusive Singapore through architecture and through policies, um, through very three very important people from representing different fields. Um, I'd like to introduce them now. So I'll, let me just bring them on here. All right. Hi, guys. So first Hi. up, uh, yes. All right. First up, we will be having uh, Koko, who is a senior research fellow at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And uh, following that, we'll have a sharing session by Liana, who is a best-selling author of uh, a very good book called Homeless, The Untold Story of a Mother in Crazy Rich Singapore. Uh, she'll be sharing a, sharing a bit of her personal policy, uh, sorry, personal stories and, uh, you know, her experience in Singapore. Sorry, I'm all thinking about policy all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and finally, we have Jan, uh, whom I've known for quite a while, Jan Folan, who is the founder of uh, Waito Singapore, uh, who's also working on an interesting project as part of Archifest this year, uh, which is about building a mobile homeless shelters uh, so he'll share more about that um, so welcome everyone uh probably to to kick start the the conversation i'm gonna give uh Koko the time first and then we'll bring liana and Lian on and if you have any questions uh, if you're watching us do uh, post your questions in the facebook comment section uh, we will be addressing them later um, so we expect to be spending about 30 minutes or so uh, with this sharing session, and we'll be taking Q&As after that. So feel free to comment in the comment section on Facebook. We will be watching. All right, uh, Koko, it's over to you now. Thank you, Prashan. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you also to the projector for the invitation to join uh, this evening's event. Um, as Prashan mentioned, I'm, a, I'm an actor academic at the LKY school uh, where I work on housing and income security issues uh, including the uh, uh, street count of homelessness last year. Uh, at, the, at the school I'm also working on a new research program that's called the Social Inclusion Project 
where we are uh, we are we are interested to understand how public policies can facilitate people's opportunities for for participation in society. So it, it's uh, that perspective that I I I brought uh, when when watching the the documentary, what it takes to to make a home. Um, maybe first a a, a bit of uh, a bit of background right on homelessness in in Singapore that Prashant asked me to do, uh, based on the street count that that we completed last year. Um, that was a, a fairly large scale study. Uh, to to find out how many people were sleeping in public places in Singapore, right? We 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 thought of the study because um, I felt it was important to understand the scale and nature of of the problem systematically, uh, in order to to be able to respond. And of course, a study like that had not been done before. Uh, we did do a, a, a pilot in twenty seventeen, uh, but it was not on a on a national scale, right? Um, there, there are there are multiple challenges to to a study like that, uh, mainly to do with counting a mobile and and concealed population, right? and, and we had no ex local example to refer to, so we had to learn from uh, what researchers were doing elsewhere, and of course from our twenty seventeen pilot. So in the end, uh, the study had <laughs> involved a mobilization of uh, around four hundred and eighty volunteers, every one of them trained by the research team. Uh, what do we find? Uh, the, some of the main findings, uh, of course, is the the, the number right uh, that that has been in, in the press. Uh, there are around we found a thousand people sleeping in public places on any single night. Uh, they are mostly older men. Um, the distribution is quite widespread, uh, and homelessness can be quite persistent so long term. But we did find concentrations in in poorer neighborhoods. Among the homeless people we spoke to, they said the main reasons for homelessness were, were economic, to do with uh, irregular employment uh, and low wages. Uh, they had to do with uh, uh, barriers to housing, such as uh, being unable to afford rent or mortgage, and of course, uh, family issues. In the, in the months since, uh, we've had time to think about the study and I, I realized that a study like this can deepen kind of public awareness of the issue of homelessness. And it has encouraged volunteerism um, and provided some guidance for the development of services. Of course, it creates a, a strong rationale and momentum, I hope, uh, for policy responses. <clears throat> and um, at the same time, a study like this, it's, it's foundational right, in its nature. It can provide a baseline for us to monitor change and, and progress. So, so that's the study. Um, in terms of the, the, the film that we're gathered here today to discuss, when watching it, I thought it brought out very well uh, two, two aspects of homelessness, uh, both its universal aspects as well as, as its uh, local aspects. So when I talk about the universal aspects of homelessness, um, I, I, I thought the, the short film uh, draws out very well uh, the kind of international definition of homelessness. Right? So in, in homelessness research, we, we take the term to mean inadequate housing. So to say that someone is homeless is to have a notion of what it means to be homed, right? Or adequate housing. And this adequate housing has three dimensions. The first is security or stability of tenure. Um, and and one of the, the the architects in the film, Alexander, he said something like when he talked about homeless people's belongings being cleared from under the bridge, he he said something like every second someone could come and change my life and turn it upside down. Right. So it's that notion of homelessness being extremely uh, uh, unstable. Right. And of course, in Singapore, we we also. Uh, learned that uh, homeless people face that problem, right? being moved on in short-term shelters and, and so on. Second dimension of um, adequacy is physical, right? having sufficient space and being in a safe structure. Here, I think the first uh, interviewee to appear on the film explained this very well, right? Vincent Brown, the, the veteran. Um, I, I, I was very struck by how he paid such close attention to the use of tarp as well as cardboard and other building materials to, to make his living environment kind of livable, right? And he said this, my tent is collapsing all the time, right? I thought that brought up very well the physical dimension of, of homelessness, how, how physically often it's not adequate. And thirdly, um, 
Adequate housing has to be socially adequate, meaning it's conducive for social relationships. So in the documentary, <clears throat> one of the interviewees, was, uh, Kevin, his name, he talked about how he finds solace in community, <clears throat> right? in people who make him feel safe. So he was saying that <clears throat> being um, home to him is not about four walls. It's about being in touch with people who, who make him feel safe. Right? So that's really important. It stresses the social dimension of housing. So someone is, <clears throat> is homeless if the living environment uh, is inadequate or falls short in one of these ways, right, in terms of stability or physical or social adequacy. And, and this is all true in the case of Singapore as well. So, so those are the universal aspects of homelessness. But in the past year, um, since we, we conducted that study, I've also been kind of learning about the local aspects of homelessness. Right? So <clears throat> as, a, as a social issue, a social challenge, I think homelessness always exploits the, the fault lines and weaknesses in society. Right? So in the short film, we saw how veterans like Vincent struggle. So we know that in the US, the well, welfare of veterans has long been a challenge. Um, but the profile of homeless people in Singapore, as I mentioned earlier, tends to be older men. So it reflects how in Singapore, we have had persistent challenges with insecure and low wage work, mainly among older workers. So that comes out in the, in the profile of homeless people in Singapore. But when we talk about the local aspects of homelessness, I thought what's really important is how it highlights kind of the borders of social inclusion in each society. Since the time we, we did a pilot in 2017, last year's study, uh, whenever I talk about the study, sometimes in people's questions and, and responses, uh, I've picked up on certain, certain attitudes that, that highlights where social inclusion and exclusion takes place in our society. So sometimes when I talk about homelessness, people will say, but are they Singaporeans? But are they Singaporeans? So I, I suppose the second part of their comment, which is often unspoken, is that if they were not, the, if the homeless people are not Singaporean, then it's not, or it's less of a problem. So this, of course, reflects maybe our attitudes towards migrants as a society and, and how much more work we, we need to do in this respect. Um, the other very prominent local aspect of homelessness, I think, is our attitudes towards home owning. Right? And, and this bleeds into public discussions of, of homelessness. So often when I talk about homelessness, people will ask, are they really homeless? Right? Are you sure they didn't just fall asleep? Right? Or they'll say, uh, but actually these people used to own housing. So I've learned that talking about homelessness in Singapore is to sometimes invite disbelief, uh, if not blame, right? Um, I've detected a lot of moralization around the purchasing and owning, especially of HDB housing in our home owning society. It's almost as if our, our national success story has also become an, an individual moral code. Right? So homeless people in Singapore are not just a numerical minority, um, they are sometimes judged to have failed at home owning. Right? So to be homeless is to have fallen short in, in some way. And this, narr this narrative then runs through society, through public attitudes, as well as through public policy, and, and the two are mutually reinforcing. So we see it in the policing of spaces in public housing estates, through both law enforcement, as well as defensive architecture, often, I think, instigated by anxious residents, meaning homeowners. We see it in the poor quality of public rental housing, which is the next most kind of realizable option for homeless people, uh, where single tenants are required to share a, a small space with no bedrooms with another complete stranger. So when I, th I look at the quality of public rental housing, this comment in the film struck me. Right? One of the ar architects said they are often asked, why are you building something that is so nice for the homeless community? Sometimes this attitude, I think, seeps through when we look at the poor quality of public rental housing. Why does it need to be better? Right? And, and of course, we, we experienced some of these attitudes towards homelessness and owning uh, in our research itself. Right? I think it's worth reflecting on why it was only in 2019 that the first study to count the number of homeless people in Singapore was done. Right. Uh, there are many obstacles uh, to doing research that challenges the narrative of home ownership. And, and to be honest, I wasn't always sure that the study would be completed, uh, but I'm glad that it has. Right. So if 
homelessness in Singapore has to do with um, social exclusion, has to do with our public attitudes and our public policies. I think it signals where possible responses and solutions should come from. And I'm sure we'll get a chance to discuss this later. Uh, that's all from me for now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kako. All right. Uh, yeah, so probably I'll, I'll... So if you haven't watched the documentary, it's called What It Takes to Make a Home. Uh, it's available on the projector.sg slash plus. It's a 30-minute documentary, um, so do, do check it out. Uh, you can rent it. Uh, and watch it at home. You don't need to come to the cinema. So it's a video on demand. Uh, we'll, we'll share more information and that's available till 15th October. Uh, I'll bring Liana on now. Hi, Liana. Hello, Prashant. All right, it's your time now. Go ahead. <laughs> First and foremost, thank you so much for bringing me on board into this discussion. So um, I was told to share a bit of my story, but uh, I got a screener's link to the what it takes to make a home um, by the projector. And I, when I was watching that short 30 minutes documentary, I would say that it brings me back to home, per se, back then when I was homeless. And it is kind of surprising. It's a surprising feeling for me because I am at a stage in my life where I am in a proper home where, you know, there's a roof over my head, a proper brick roof over my head for my family. Um, but when I was watching the 30 Minutes documentary, um, I was pretty sh shocked to, to observe in myself that I felt a uh, very relatable to what was, was shared. And at the same time, I can feel what it feels for the, for the veterans that was interviewed online, and even the, one of the homeless um, chat by the mean of Kevin. So for me, in a local context in Singapore, I didn't know that homelessness exists here in Singapore until the point when I was homeless myself. And it happens in... 2009, uh, in the morning of Hari Raya, where usually the Muslim families will be like um, reuniting together, seeking forgiveness, and having a joyous occasion with their fa with their other family members. In my case, in 2009, that morning, um, my then husband and myself we got chased out of the flat. Uh, it was my mother-in-law's flat, um, and at that morning itself. We it was a shocking turn of events because we did not expect that to happen. We do not know what was the reason. And there we were with chunks of items just being thrown out of her unit. And she, we just accumulated everything into piles of plastic bags and made our way to Sembawang Park. Uh, we borrowed a tent, a blue tent from one of our cousins, and we we pitch up the tent by the beach because thinking that it's the festive period and we would like to just ride it over and also saying to ourselves that this is just temporary. Little did we know that particular uh, experience itself extended from an initial thought of a three days stay or three days camp by the beach to a three month stay because we I myself find it hard to seek aid in Singapore back then. When, when I was at the park, that was when I got to know the other homeless families that were there even like months prior. It kind of shocked me, not only my, at my own state of homelessness, but at the point of discovering the other homeless families as well. Um, but the, the thing which I find is very memorable is the kampung spirit that we had. Um, it's the unity that we had together because all of us, the, the homeless families back then um, by the beach, uh, each of us are facing our own challenges, right? But we end up helping one another to survive, to watch out for our belongings in the tent when we are out um, to find help from the family service centers. Uh, we find us cooking for one another. Um, and there's the spirit of togetherness that I find um, missing in today's context, even when I am in a proper home, right? So that's why when I watched the 30 Minutes documentary, kind of like uh, made me relate to and feel more at home 
on that note, if that ever makes sense. So back to my story. Uh, it was only um, it it was only out of sheer luck that I can get myself out of the situation. But even before that happened, I reached to a brink of losing hope because the the system that I find to find the help and find the help and the, the aid that I need, not only for myself, but for the other family members by the beach is not that straightforward. I found myself getting to uh, be pushed from one organization to another, uh, from the Family Service Center to the uh, Social Service Office to the, uh, meet the Meet the Member of Parliament session. So there are various processes and stages which can really break down someone when they are really at their lowest point of their life. So from that particular experience itself, it made me back then, I think, uh, it depressed, to be honest, but it's just that I didn't get to seek you know, the proper uh, diagnosis from, uh, from the clinic. But there was a point of time after a visit back from the uh, one of the family service center or one of the social service office here in Singapore where I really lost hope because after weeks and months of searching for help still uh, leads to nothing and I just slept I remember I slept in the tent by the beach for about two weeks not wanting to do anything and just sleep and try to you know escape into the dream away from the real world so that was what happened to me. But uh, one fine day on the 30th of December, 2009, uh, out of sheer luck and by the help of strangers, uh, I, got to, I got to know two gentlemen and they were the one who uh, found out more about my story. And little that I know, uh, after that, that initial phase of interview, they wrote in to the MP of my uh, constituency they, re they wrote on behalf of my plight and they asked uh, for, for help, for me and my family especially. And back then I was also pregnant, <laughs> which I forgot to mention earlier. So being pregnant, being homeless, trying to find help over weeks and months and I couldn't get any until the point of time where uh, it has been like, what, three months uh, since that, uh, that morning of Hari Raya when we got kicked out and we met that two strangers. When they, when they wrote the letter, that was when we received help. We received uh, phone calls from the organizations that I've approached before. And they mentioned to me that they have the shelter and they can arrange for a van to pick up me and my children. However, um, even moving to the shelter, it was quite it was quite an experience because uh, there's a lack of privacy altogether. When I reached there, it was a three-room flat here in Singapore, and the other two rooms are already preoccupied with other families. And I mentioned because of the short, um, short period where they would need to make arrangements for us, we will just need to make do with what they have at the moment, and we were put up in the uh, living room, living space of that three-room flat. Little privacy, there's no curtains to draw in or out, and we got ourselves um, sandwiched in between, you know, other families coming out from their rooms to um, use the kitchen, and other families getting out of their rooms to exit that particular uh, flat, so the, the door is right beside us. And we find that the, we find that for me, my, my young children, as well as my then husband, we find that we've feel more safe, more secure, more, we have some privacy in our own tent room as opposed to when we were at the shelter back then. And long story short, I think most of that you can read in my book, but it took me almost three years to find myself, to fine tune my own mindset and to bring my family out of um, one, homelessness, second, out of poverty, because I came from a very challenged family background, and three, to escape societal norms, because when I was there, living in, a, transiting from shelter to shelter and living in a rental flat, 
you face certain societal stigmas that initially you thought that it was just, you know, um, conversations or coffee, coffee shop uh, convos, right? But in fact, it does exist in real life. So that's a bit about my story. Thank you, Prashant. Thank you, Leona. I'm sure it's it's not easy sharing this story, uh, but thank you for for you know agreeing to do this. Um, I mean, I've, just for those who have joined us, uh, Leona is the author of this book called Homeless: uh, Untold Story of a Mother's Struggle in Crazy Rich Singapore. Uh, I've read it, and it's it's uh, I, 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 yeah. I mean, I think please. Head to Epigram and get the book. Um, you you really get a bit of insight into the challenges and struggles. But I mean, what was interesting was, as you talked about, was this whole um, kampong spirit or community mm. that you had uh, together with the people at the park. Um, you know, even talking about like, oh, maybe we should leave and all go to West Coast when you know people started policing and and all that. So, I mean, to me that was also interesting in how. Sometimes, and, and this relates to a bit of the documentary that uh, Coco addressed where Kevin talks about, he felt more violence within four walls and safety mm. outside, uh, you know, in a community that he found. Um, yeah, and I mean, that, that's something that we, we can talk about later also. But um, yeah, thank you once again Definitely. for sharing. Yeah, uh, I'll thank bring Jan on for now. Thanks. All right, yeah. And, Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Passion, for inviting me. I really appreciate. It. Um, and thank you, uh, like, for this inspiring um, uh, talk by by Liana and also um, uh, like uh, Coco. Uh, very, very, very interesting, very inspiring because it is exactly what we've been doing on our end to try to basically design a better world for the for the people. Uh, so I am Jan. I run. Uh, my own practice in um, in, in Singapore. Uh, so his name is Rito. So he's written uh, at the back of the, of the screen. Um, and so we have been engaged a lot in uh, designing for the community, designing design with the cause. That that's our uh, motto. That's uh, that, that's what is driving us. And and actually, how, how we ended up in in designing this uh, shelter for for the homeless. My, my, my office is located in Chinatown in Chin Sui Estate. Uh, so for the one who know who don't know what is Chin Sui Estate, it is uh, this a complex of HDB um, that is right in the city center, and that is it is many rental rental flats, and so we have a lot of uh, homeless uh, living living around, and so during the circuit breaker, I was coming here every week to uh, to take care of the office and and so on, and it is where I could see even more uh, homeless being like like just walking around and being chased away by the ambassador because they, they didn't have the right to sit down um, and so that that and even the night where like we have homeless and like, like sleeping on the landing zone that that's very regular um, and so it was like how us architects and designers what can we do to to help um to help the people in need and especially the people in need surrounding us in chinsui estate so uh then we started to to make uh, the, the research and we found the research of, of Coco, which was very inspiring for us, uh, to really start basically thinking of this um, of this shelter. So I will be sharing my screen to share with you a bit of what we did, so you have a better like uh, visual representation of uh, of uh, our work. So I will be sharing my screen, share screen, and then that should be all right. So. Uh, Enter your screen, and here you go. You are supposed to see my screen. Uh, so I hope that you can see it. Uh, yes, I hope that you can see it. So let me know uh, if you cannot see it. Because um, I can see only my screen, and I cannot see anything else. So I, I, I hope that you can see my screen. So design with a cause. Um, it is what we, um, well, what what is driving us in my, in my office. Uh, with, so when we, we started a few years ago in 2000. Uh, 15 to design this mobile lotus in, in Cambodia on the Sunnesat Lake, so that's the lake. Um, and so already at that time, we started to do this floating clinic to reach out to the most needy uh, in the middle of the lake, those floating villages that had no access to any kind of health uh, uh, structure. So that's what we designed, and we even conducted uh, a workshop in Cambodia 
with students from Singapore, uh, from Australia, and of course from Cambodia to design this prototype of this uh, floating uh, clinic. So fast forward, 2020, uh, Archifest, and so we were invited by, by the Archifest team to, to, uh, to take part to, to the festival of this year. And so uh, we contacted for that Singapore Polytechnic. So you can see here our, uh, our partners and so on, and Singapore Polytechnic um, they welcomed us to, to run this workshop with the students from three different faculties, um, from uh, architecture, interior design, and civil engineering to design and construct this prototype for uh, a shelter for homeless in Singapore. So the, the student worked tremendously over, th over three weeks from design to construction. So thanks, for, thanks to Singapore Polytechnic to welcome us uh, to utilize um, all of their workshop. Uh, thanks to the student for their dedication in that. Thanks to also the, the, the wood uh, suppliers that, that brought us sort of uh, this, uh, this food and of course uh, Archifest and, and even now Design Singapore because it will be exhibited at the National Design Center. So basically, um, so this uh, flows, designing to serve, so fostering local outreach and welcoming sustainability. Well, when we started on that, um, I was not expecting such response from the younger generation, a very young students who are uh, engaged in, in all of these uh, social uh, issues that Singapore is facing. Um, so that's uh, the, the, the outcome, and I will be explaining to you the whole process. Uh, we live in the tropics, we, we, we live in a very specific environment, and this shelter is to provide um, a, a sense of safety and, and security to the homeless. Um, down, down my HDB here, um, there is a, a lady that lives on the cart, and she just brings her cart from one location to another. And I'm very curious to see where she sleeps at night. Uh, so it is here to provide a sense of safety, a sense of security, and this um, very uh, traditional element of what is a house um, which, uh, with, with a pitch roof and to also provide a naturally ventilated um, uh, a facade for, for a better um, uh, environment inside. So it started with one week of designing with the student. Uh, they contributed and they did all of the research as well. They, they, they read extensively uh, a lot of articles and the, the research done by Coco. And then the, the process started to, to design, to brainstorm, um, and to see what are the basic needs of uh, human uh, of human living. So, um, so that was in SP. So basically sketching, um, uh, looking at the stability of the structure, and also all of the, the ergonomy of what is needed. We observed a lot as well, um, uh, the homelets and what they need. Uh, sometimes it's just like some plastic bags, uh, something where you can hang your clothes uh, when they are wet and, and so on. That led to the week two when we um, uh, started to formalize, to utilize the, the different um, machine and something to cut uh, and to understand basically the material it is all in wood uh, to be um, uh, to be highly sustainable it is also to demonstrate that we have a, a long history of dealing with wood in our region and we shall not forget that the idea of the compound is definitely utilizing wood as the main uh, material um, so here we can see how uh, all of the, the teams were working together across all of the, all of the different faculties and then um, the, the interior design, while, while the civil, civil engineer, they were uh, looking into the skeleton, the stability, the interior design were looking at all of the ergonomy. A bed where we can lay, a small little desk that we can place some elements on it, um, a ledge or a kind of uh, step where we can put things underneath, um, because from the reading that we could get as well is this uh, concern of like things being stolen as well. So that was uh, some of the pictures in, in, that we take inside. Uh, so that's the, the kind of place with something very, very simple. And so you can place your things on the side if you want to have a look at your at your belonging. Um, and you can see here this kind of slat. It is basically to hang clothes because most of the time the uh, the homeless they can they wash also their own clothes by hand. So it is and like like a few days ago I came back to the office and 
And we could, I could see right in our plant outside of the office, basically the homeless hanging their, their own clothes uh, to dry because that's one of the locations that they can um, that they can put their clothes to dry. Um, that was during the construction. Obviously, the roof was not yet uh, installed. And so this kind of step like this where sometimes you might just want to sit there, put your things underneath, uh, being somehow protected, but also feeling like to, to feel connected to the outside world. Uh, so again, a sense of privacy and, and safety while also being connected. So it's not a kind of room with a door. Uh, that's why we decided not to have any door on it. So you can understand better here the step, the bed, and that ledge. Um, and everything is, um, you can dismantle easily. Everything is not sandboard. There is no nails. Uh, it's all uh, dismantleable and transportable. So that's what, that's what you can see here. The facade as well. Uh, for natural, natural ventilation, uh, and then suddenly the assembly, where we can see uh, how it is easily built and easily assembled. Um, so um, that's for the whole process, and the skeleton being put in place, very simple system, traditional uh, technique, um, so nuts and bolts and, and wooden components. Uh, all of this wood is recycled wood, so it is also contributing to sustainability and circularity. Um, so not overly high tech, um, for Singapore, that is supposed to be a highly progressive kind of uh, um, uh, metropolis, but here we are really down to earth with what we want to do. So those are the five. That's the final element, uh, the drawing that you can see here, and that's uh, the entire shelter. So yes, it is all in wood because it is not to be entirely outside. It is to be hopefully on a void deck. We hope that we can appeal to HDB to perhaps put this shelter in one of the void deck in our neighborhood. That's why it is, uh, it is yes, sheltered, but it is not fully under the sun or under the rain, under the rain because the, the homeless in our neighborhood basically they sleep within the void deck. So it is to have a small little nuke like that. Um, so, that so that's it um, uh, for, this, uh, for this shelter. So I will stop uh, sharing my screen and screen yes i'm back so so we learned a lot when we're doing all of this uh, we learned how to work together with the students from different disciplines we learn also the, the the various needs of the of the homeless um, and also the, the whole aim of such project is to raise awareness um, that uh, homeless is is a real uh, issue that is happening right like under our void deck so that's why we we really hope that we can trigger discussion and that can open up um, for more public discourse on it. So uh, thanks again for Singapore Polytechnic and thanks also the projector to, for offering us such platform to share what we've been doing for the past three weeks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jan. All right, maybe I'll, I'll bring everyone to the stream. All right, Paco and Liana are back with us. <clears throat> All right. Yeah. I mean, um, so thank you everyone for sharing. Uh, for those who are just joining us or who don't know what's happening, uh, this is a projector Facebook live session. We are here to talk about uh, what it takes to make a home. Uh, this is following a documentary that we are showing on the projector plus uh, our online platform as part of Archifest. And, um, you know, to talk about homelessness, the documentary itself uh, is through the support of the Canadian Centre for Architecture. Uh, but we would like to contextualise and localise the issues in Singapore. And that's why we've assembled a team of experts, I would say, or, uh, you know, people who are involved in the field in some way or another. So we have uh, Koko, who's uh, a senior fellow at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, we have Liana Damira, who uh, is the author of Homeless, the untold story of a uh, mother's struggle in crazy rich Singapore. And Jan, who just finished sharing about, uh, sorry, Jan from Waito, who just finished sharing about this uh, homeless shelter that is constructed with uh, Singapore Polytechnic students. So thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a few things that came up uh, in, in today's discussions. Uh, what, what's, is, do you all have something that you want to address immediately that uh, someone has talked about? No? Or should I warm it up with a few questions first? So. <laughs> uh, well, there's, there's, a, there's an audience question, so maybe we, we can, can go into that. Let me try and see if it shows up. 
Uh, okay, it actually doesn't show up in full because it was a very long comment, but I'll, I'll actually read the, the questions part of it and if you can try. Um, so yeah, I mean, if we wish to move to a more inclusive society, how might an average Singaporean who has managed to engage in social mobility change his attitude towards home ownership? Like, can it be done through architecture? Um, or does it need to be done through a new set of policies to influence society? I think, I mean, just, just to, to bring that a bit, um, in, in the documentary itself, uh, we see architects building integrated buildings in a way where both, you know, either in, in Austria where there are students living with the homeless in, in one building, and, you know, where the circulation is designed such that people interact with each other and they're not separated and, and marginalized in, in different, you know, uh, buildings, for example. Uh, you don't really see that happening in Singapore where, you know, rental flats, for example, are separate. They may be part of a neighborhood, but still at a fringe or whereas there's very few like integrated buildings where there's, you know, home ownership and that. So, I, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know if, uh, if you guys would like to respond to that uh, in terms of how we can promote integration uh, architecturally or, you know, in, in terms of community design uh, between homeless individuals and, you know, people who, who own homes, for example. Um, I, I, maybe I'll say a couple of things, uh, which is that, um, so how is question about what can we do as individuals, right, about public attitudes? I think sometimes it feels like public attitudes is a very big thing to tackle, it's beyond us. Uh, but equally important to remember that um, for, for policymakers react to feedback, right? And often when, when faced with issues such as the issues that may provoke a NIMBY reaction, they may get only feedback from people who are unhappy, but not hear from people who, who, who are supportive of the project, right? So one concrete thing that we all can do as, as residents, if we are in public housing estates, is that if you support certain ideas, such as Yan and Waito's project, go let your MP know, right? Go let your RC know. Um, so, so make your views heard, right? You may feel it's it's not much, but it's very important, right? So, if you see, for example, defensive architecture in your void deck, right? People putting up an armrest on the bench just so that someone cannot lie across it. Uh, let your RC members know that you don't support that, and then tell your MP you you don't you find it unacceptable. And if White House project becomes considered for the void deck where you live. Let your MP know that you think it's a great idea. I, mean, I, I think it's a really powerful I, idea to say that we want to place the, that mobile shelter that, that um, Y2 has come up with in the void deck, right? And one of the, the kind of mind-boggling aspects of that, the study that we did is that void decks were actually the most common place where we found homeless people. I mean, just let that sink in for a while, right? That the most likely place to find homeless people is right alongside homeowners. Right. There's something about that that doesn't sit right, that doesn't completely make sense. Uh, we know, of course, why that makes sense, because it's fairly safe, it's covered, and so on. But homelessness occurs at its most as at its densest, right? Right in the midst of a housing estate. And so the void that if we if we all recall the design, so so the question was about can architecture do anything about it? The void deck was always meant to be a space of inclusion, of community building of mingling and bonding, right? It was supposed to be a breaking down of walls, right? And yet now that has become the most political of spaces, right? From which we eject homeless people and say that it belongs to me. How can the void that belong to anybody, right? It was always meant to be an open space. So I, I, I really applaud kind of Waito's idea to, to even just provoke the, the thought, you know, of putting these mobile shelters within the void that to reclaim that space, well, for everybody. Right to to ask that question, I, I think is really important. Thanks, Coco. Yeah, I mean, actually, well, one thing I observe is even with new housing estates, the void deck is almost eradicated in favor of like a multi-purpose shed kind of thing that's central for the funerals and weddings and all that, rather than under the building. I'm I'm not sure it's whether because we're building much taller and therefore we can't. You know the structure doesn't work the same way, but um, yeah, it's interesting that this an eradication of you know communal or community space right under where you live, like it's it's almost like you need to go somewhere to a little distant from where your home is, 
Um, yeah, so I mean, it's, it's yeah, I've always talked about claim, reclaiming the bike deck and, and hopefully, you know, HDB will also look into that in terms of design. Um, yeah, so and, and if, if, I, if, yeah. I, if I can jump on, on that, because, yes, um, please. Uh, because basically it is what triggered uh, what, what we wanted to do. Because like in, in, our, in our estates, the very deck is quite extensive, it's quite big, uh, it's all connected. Uh, instead of the podium of the HDB, you can really go from one block to another without even touching ground. And actually you have a lot of hidden corners or dead ends, landing zone leading to nowhere. Um, and that they started to uh, fence uh, because it was opportunities for the homeless to sleep. And then that the homeless are still sleeping in those, in those corners. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm working very late, I'm an architect. So usually when I, when I leave the office, uh, then I can see them sleeping just outside of, of our office in the landing room downstairs. Um, so if you live around here, then you, can, then you can see them. And then, and then of course it triggers something where what can we do, what, what can architecture do to include them better? and to not be seen as something that we want to hide at, at all time. Um, but it is true that for the past two years, uh, all of the benches that were around have been removed. Uh, they have been replaced with a one-seater with the armrest, uh, where you have people trained to, to be on it, but they cannot really sleep on that anymore. Um, so so that, that the, the, the landscape, the urban scape has changed. And instead of addressing the issue of the homeless, it's just like trying to, to kick them out. But actually, they still they still stay here because it is a, a high traffic area where you have a lot of activities, but they feel connected also at some point. So, uh, so yes, architecture should should respond to that instead of fencing them away, but more how to welcome them and how to create that bridge between people living here, people who are transient, and people who are just looking for help for one night or two nights, something like this. Mm. Liana, I don't know. I mean, if you, if you want to share a bit on like how, I mean, for you in terms of, I mean, suddenly being confronted with, with being homeless um, that, that day, like how, how do you decide on where to go? And, you know, and, and also, I mean, you know, in terms of talking to the community that you found at Samoan Park, like, you know, how, how people arrived at that space? Like, I mean, mm. are you able to share a bit on that? Um, one thing in common which I find from from asking the other families why they they come over to the park instead of you know going down to the void decks or having a place where it doesn't involve us being exposed to the weather was that they mentioned and me myself included experience that we have a high tendency of being chased out when we are in you know like void deck spaces or a place where it's easily accessible by the authorities. And once when that happened, we will have nowhere to go. And it will usually happen in the day of the uh, in the day bit of the night where it's like in the it's either in the wee mornings like 2, 3 a.m. And it is something which uh which hinders one person, especially when they are not mobile anymore. They they are homeless. They depend on like uh, public transport. And then when such thing happens in the middle of the night, like 2, 3 a.m., it limits them on where's the next stop that they want to go, they, they can go. So mm -hmm. that is one of the finding when I asked the other families by the beach, like why they choose, you know, staying by the beach instead of um, staying somewhere else. Um, and another thing which I think would be also useful if I were to point this out is that uh, when I transit from shelter to shelter, I found out that the shelters that the many helping hands approach are uh, doing here in Singapore is that they, they rent out units from current HDB flats, like different, um, different towns and different estates. And they uh, use that rental units as the shelter for the destitute families, for the displaced families, as they call it. And I find that within that block, nobody, nobody can know that, you know, um, just next door in our normal, ordinary Singaporean flat, there are the homeless um, family who is staying in that particular unit itself. And it's bewildering for me to, you know, to 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 observe and to even experience it myself that oh i'm i'm staying in a shelter but the shelter is in a hdb flat which you know mm -hmm. any other singaporeans can 
can be a homeowner of that that particular unit too. So I think it helps if there is an inclusion for the homeless families to be placed amongst the other members of the society without having the need to, you know, like really differentiate them, really um, create a separate space for, for them to, to live in and marginalize them further. Like for example, the rental units here in Singapore. And instead, uh, you know, build rental units beside even homeowners units, if that is even possible. Yeah. Right, and, and while, while, while you were in these shelters, like how long was that? Um, I mean, we talked about, you know, the, the security of tenure and, and such. Um, I mean, for you in terms of going through these shelters, like when you were there in that unit, although, you know, it was next to like other homeowners and all, how long were you expecting to be there or were you waiting for, for things to happen? Oh, uh, for me, myself, when I was in the shelters, uh, we were given only like a month or three months worth of contract in a way where we can get to stay there and it's usually um, extendable or mm -hmm. uh, recontractable um, after right. the term ends and it's usually uh, sh a short term, it's not long. Right. However, like other shelters which I have known who are still um, operating to date, uh, they minimally uh, include a two-year contract. So that is mm -hmm. something okay. that is still workable. Right. And it's a two-year contract in terms of, and the fees are paid for through your Oh, the own... fees are paid for the managing yeah. managing of the shelter itself. Right. And, and these and are and talking about that... shelters within the HDB. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think I, I just want to bring up this point from Ginger, who Ginger June, who actually also runs the transgender shelter uh, in Singapore, the T shelter. Um, I mean, she talks about stop seeing homeless homelessness as a problem and see them as a capable community that needs support at this stage in their life. And and this is something that comes up in the documentary also, where in in that housing block, there you know workshops for for them, and in terms of and it's it's all designed where. There are ways to empower and give jobs to people within that, that community and the building. Um, Leanna, I'm not sure if uh, you'd like to share about in terms of for you to go from, you know, being homeless to an entrepreneur, what that journey was like and, and you know, what, what you think that others can benefit from in this experience if, they, if they're watching. Mm, from homeless to entrepreneurship. One, one thing for sure that I didn't get was from the shelters classes <laughs> right <laughs> as much as they were initially designed to help the homeless to you know break away from wherever they are at and maybe achieve a breakthrough in their own life or in their own lives uh it doesn't it doesn't help in that way in my case uh so what, for what me, kind I, of classes are these uh they were financial um financial management classes or they were how to cook healthy recipes classes. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and is, also... Is that the assumption that you're homeless because you couldn't, you know, manage your couldn't finances? Couldn't have. Or, yes. Yeah. So it's either okay. you couldn't manage your finance or you do not know what sort of ingredients that are healthy or much more um, cost effective for you to cook for your family or something like that. Right. So okay. those kind of classes kind of like, uh, for me, I find, yes, this is something that we have been doing all this while. And hey, um, it's not a mind-blowing thing to know that it doesn't help us anywhere from there on, right? But for me, I find what, what helps was to break away from the societal norms. And that is to be fixed in a system where at the end of that particular term or the end of that particular aid, they expect you to work and get, get gainfully employed. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is a KPI, for example, like uh, you will have to get employed within three, six months time. So there is this period where you will need to work on yourself. But at the same time, for me, if I were to, to look at my own situation, I have young kids to care for. I just gave birth, right? When I was homeless, I was pregnant. And then when I, I went to the shelter, I just gave birth to a baby. So uh, infant care is not cheap as well. So we will have to juggle between, you know, the care for the kids and bringing back the dough or the food on the table. And at the same time, also the, the thinking of 
other people in the society saying that you know this is doable you can you can get out of homelessness only if you work hard and this this kind of like um trigger me in a, in a way where you mean that I'm not working hard enough to get myself mm-hmm. out of this situation that I have to work if that I have to work even harder so yeah those are the kind of things but what eventually flipped for me is to not go through the same system that mm-hmm. I was plugging into the welfare aid but instead pulling myself out of that out of that and educating myself self taught myself how to um access internet access online resources and from there on that was when i find uh, there are more opportunities and avenues that open up for me and hence that trick that intrigues me into entrepreneurship right okay are, are, are you working with any other like homeless um, persons now or with with your mm. At the moment, uh, yes, the other classification of homeless is not um, typically in Singapore, like sleeping under the void decks or in mm-hmm. the tents, right? There are other homeless uh, families who couch surf or they stay from one home uh, or mm-hmm. friends' home or family homes to another from time yeah. to time. So I find myself working with um, other single ladies, uh, single mothers, who uh, who. I wouldn't say couch surf, but more of like staying with their family, families and friends from one home to another, and then mm-hmm. I I teach them how to you know do virtual assistance work online, mm-hmm. and give them access to laptops and internet, and that is how they eventually work themselves out of that too. Right. Okay. Mm. Great. Yeah, I mean, I I, th- I think one thing that came through also, and Toko shared about this was about the whole, um, you know, stigmatization and in terms of also design, like why sometimes you know shelters may not have the same uh, qualities or benefits as say a, a proper you know house or HDB facility kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I I think we I I wanted to address this whole thing about how stigmatization and, you know, the challenges of seeking aid, um, you know, that and whether the design and, and architecture can can facilitate that. And, and Jan, I mean, I think um, Howie has another question here about, you know, whether putting a home under a void deck is actually almost drawing attention to them rather than... So there's this whole issue of, like, whether it should be invisible or not. And, and, you know, where, where the balance is, um, you know, should we like scoop everyone away and put them in some shelter that nobody sees? Or as some people would say, you know, like even for the migrant workers to put them on a barge or, you know, an offshore island kind of thing, or whether we should, you know, like actually try and integrate them in the community. Like, uh, do you have any thoughts to that, Jan? Yes, yes, I, I think that's, that's a very good question because it's a question that together with the student who are asking ourselves, um, the validity of, uh, of a shelter and, uh, and to have it, to have a shelter right in the middle of a void deck will it attract and indeed like having a stigma over it um, by, by showing that, oh, it is there, that's, that's the shelter, that's the home that he's, he's or she's inside. Um, and the, and the whole the whole discussion on, on that was how can we design something that yes attracts at attention, but that can be located in something that is somehow hidden, but that you can see, but it is not right in the middle of the of the, the, the void deck. Um, and and also to in the design of it to have something that doesn't look like something bad, something that is. Uh, interesting and that can trigger curiosity from the people passing by and to have a sort of threshold. That's why the way of entering inside that shelter is not straight ahead you see inside. You, you have this kind of turning around, you know, that, like all of our public toilets where you turn around like that. And so it's an invitation. And even with the, the interior design team, we are looking at small little attention. The fact that the shelter is slightly raised from the floor, that you can sit on that kind of step. So you are somehow in, somehow out, and then you can even sit inside where you have a second step, so to have a kind of conversation. So yes, definitely it will, it will attract attention, um, definitely, but hopefully it will attract positively attention, and more importantly that the homeless will feel welcome to be inside. Um, during daytime, most of the, most of the time homeless are, don't stay 
in, in such space. They just move around and, and they, they do their own thing because as uh, Coco was mentioning in his research as well, some of them are working. It is not as if they just do nothing all day long. So some of them are, some of them are working. So they just need a refuge for, for the night. And so that's why this shelter is for, is for this, that you, 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 you look for a place to sleep properly and then you can find that. So that's why it should be easily findable, visible, but not too much. And then to have sufficient threshold to have this sense of privacy. Uh, that's why we also have some like look out, so you can look inside, you can people can look outside to to feel connected. That, that's the most important. Sorry, very very practical question on my side. Like how in terms of sanitation, um, like in terms of shower facilities or, or toilet and all, how how did that fit into the design, if at all? It, like we don't provide that because right. sanitation. Yeah. Basically, most of the time, homeless, they go uh, to the toilet in like the swimming public. pool, yeah. uh, public toilet, uh, they will shower in a swimming pool uh, shower because for, for one dollar you can enter inside. So, so it is yeah. a common sight to see a homeless taking shower in public uh, a swimming pool um, mm -hmm. because they, like, they, they clean themselves every day. Um, yeah. So, and then, yes, in our neighborhood here, yes, they are utilizing whatever they can. Um, outside right and and so and the other thing in terms of the the design process um we i think june has a question in terms of you know um, addressing different challenges like including say the homeless transgender community they may have uh, a different you know specific issues that they may need to address like in terms of design process and consultation like um are there mediums for that uh, through design and architecture in terms of engaging the homeless or was it more for the start um, just pure on, based on research and then you know prototype and and see how we can engage the homeless from there Jan are you on mute <laughs> you're still on mute yeah, so because I was I was listening and listening at the same time. Uh, yes. Yeah. Can you can just repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. No, I I think June has a question. Who who you know she runs a transgender shelter, yes. and I, I think she's highlighting that um, in terms of issues, you know, the certain communities within the homeless also have very specific requirements, um, yes. and and design might might have to play into that. So in terms of a design process. Um, I, I know th this shelter was probably done in a short while, but um, how, how do we engage the homeless in terms of designing a shelter for them? Yes, and, that, and that's, that's okay. The, the work that we did actually um, is following also not, not only the research done by Coco, but also by one of, one of the teachers of SP, where he decided to run a, um, basically a studio at school a few years ago about homeless to design basically a shelter. And so he did a study. He went to talk to uh, to many uh, uh, homeless people and to look at, to ask them what, what they have with them. So he could do almost like an inventory of, of what they were having and what was important for them. Mm -hmm. um, because they don't have so many things, so uh, it can go uh, to um, something very simple uh, that, that you can bring every day, clothes and so on, to something for ladies. It was all of the sanitary elements were very important. Uh, they were really keeping that as like, the most important thing for them because it is also part of dignity. Um, so, in terms of designing for the for the shelter, one thing that they were coming, that they were repeating to this uh, teacher was they are always scared to for their things to be stolen. So, how can we design a shelter that they can have their bags like almost attached to, to their hands or something that will not be stolen at night? So that that's something. That's why we. When we design that shelter to have this right. kind of ledge where you put your things and you can I see it. Or when you sleep, you can still be attached to it. So, so that's why it was all of the small little things where they hold small elements and, mm -hmm. and, and how that can be kept for them. And even the other things about like washing their clothes and so on, how they can hook stuff that basically can, can dry. So the, the way that we designed it was very practical. Uh, more than to a certain type of or a certain group of people, but more basic human needs that are universal. Okay. 
Yeah, I, I, we are running out of time. So uh, maybe I think just, just to round up uh, the, the conversation and, and thank you everyone for sharing. Uh, but maybe I think because, you know, we are positioning this a bit of uh, as an Archifest uh, talk, I think to talk, to shift the conversation a bit away from shelters to a long-term accommodation and integration of, of the homeless, uh, you know, community and such. I'd just like to hear your thoughts on, on how, you know, this can be done in, or how you can envision it. I mean, you know, taking away all the practical aspects and all that, like what would be your vision in terms of, you know, long-term accommodation for, for the homeless community or how we can help. Um, Coco, do you want to kick that off? Still on mute. Yeah. Yeah, no thanks. Um, the right that, um, you know, services like outreach services, uh, which has attracted a lot of interest among volunteers, those are really important because this is a consumed population. And so outreach is the first step. Shelters is the next natural step. Um, but it didn't end there, right? So Prashan, you're quite right to point out that then what after that, right? So um, in the documentary, one of the architects mentioned the, the project, was it the one in LA? In LA they, they said it was meant to be a place yeah. where homeless people can live forever, right? I thought, uh, wow, that's, that's, that, that is, uh, I mean, this, that's the kind of aspiration we, we, we want, right? Rather than to say shelters and, and, and to mm. stop the conversation there. In the context of Singapore, I think, two things are important. And, and in this respect, we are no different from, from other places, which is to tackle homelessness in the long term, we need firstly uh, quality housing options. Mm. Right? It's not possible to talk about homelessness and tackling it without looking at what we like to think of as the mainstream kind of housing landscape. You can't. Right? Mm. And currently, the, the easiest entry point to the housing system uh, in Singapore, which is dominated by public housing, is public rental housing. And if that option uh, is inaccessible or of poor quality, we will always have a problem with homelessness because the exit route is blocked. So quality housing options is critical. The second element of this is poverty interventions, right? Um, among other things, right? So yes, homelessness has many complex reasons, uh, but it's worth thinking about how, how we often, I mean, all of us, we, we occasionally face with social conflict and, and we switch jobs and so on, but we do not all become homeless, right? If we can afford a better accommodation for the night, then we wouldn't be homeless, right? So everywhere that poverty, um, homelessness has been studied and successfully tackled, it has always involved poverty interventions. That means looking at work, looking at wages, and looking at the other drivers of poverty. So these two things, quality housing options, so that there is a smooth uh, exit route, and then comprehensive poverty interventions. If we don't talk about this, then then, then I think we'll, we'll always uh, we'll always be a few steps short right, from tackling homelessness properly. Thank you. Liana? Hmm. For me, I think apart from what Koko have already mentioned, um, it's also the way on how the community can come together and support one another because socially it takes it is similar to, um, you know, there's a popular term, it takes a village to raise a child. So mm -hmm. similarly, it's, you know, it is, a, it takes a community to bring one another up and help one another too. So apart from um, just integrating in terms of space wise and using architecture and also looking to the policies and making quality housing afford, um, affordable and there for the homeless, the, the education for the main people in the society needs to be there too, mm -hmm. and not to stigma things further. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that that is an important route as well. And more dialogues mm -hmm. like this should happen. Shouldn't be a taboo here in Singapore. <laughs> That's true. I thought, yeah, I mean, even before Kako's research, it was hardly even talked about. I mean, you sometimes see them, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. Jan, any thoughts on this? Yes, yes, I, I, I think, um, again, I'm, I would like to, to thank the, the other speakers because it's, it's very inspiring and, and um, it, it can contribute a lot to the, to the design uh, for this kind of structure. So, so your experience, Liana, or your body of work, uh, Coco, those are things that can, that can inspire architects and designers to, to design better this kind of element. Um, so, so towards the longer, um, or, or 
going from transitional to something more permanent. Uh, there can be some experimentation. It is not necessarily uh, only in a kind of HDB uh, estate, uh, although it is, it is very good to have more mixity uh, between different kind of people. Uh, again, if in, if in our neighborhood it was not only a rental flat, perhaps the, the whole estate would be better uh, looked at because when we walk around, it's like really in disrepair at some, at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it wasn't just rent, rental flat, it would be better uh, taken care of. Um, but even beyond that, to have some other ways of living. Um, yes, we live in a high dense uh, city in Singapore, high rise uh, living and so on. But we can also bring back this idea of the village. Um, uh, and, and without even talking about the nostalgia of, of the Kampu, but perhaps to really de design new typologies of like eco villages, for example, something more connected to the nature, something where it's not just a matter of placing a homeless into a, into a home. It is, and as you mentioned, also Diana is placing homeless into a context and to uh, to be to to feel that you contribute to society as well, that you are not just left aside. And that's why by having an eco village, for example, where you can uh, garden, you can do like some farming, and then you uh, and, and, and even you can have your own skills that you that you can contribute to other elements in a circular way. So so for me, the, something that is more permanent. It is not necessarily just to find a home, but to find a system where you feel you are connected, you contribute, and then you, you want to stay. And not just like to go from one place to another just because you have no place to stay and, and so on. So the future of, of, homele of homelessness for me is um, inclusive, not only by being together, but by contributing and feeling the possibility of contributing. So for me, it's more that. Great. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. Uh, we are pretty much out of time today. Um, so, yeah, uh, before I take our leave together, I'd just like to remind everyone that uh, what it takes, what it makes, it, what it takes to make a home uh, is still available for our rent at the Projector Plus uh, till 15th of October. So do check it out and, um, you know, do also follow our three speakers today in terms of uh, Cocos. Research also, you can find it um, in the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy website. Uh, Liana's book that you need to get from Epigram about her experience being homeless. And Jan, do you want to talk about uh, where your shelter is going? Yes, after this? So the, yeah, the shelter. So to, tomorrow is going to be dismantled from Singapore Polytechnic, and Friday it goes to the National Design Center. So from Saturday for the next four weeks, you can come and visit us at the National Design Center. It's at the level two. Uh, thanks again to Design Singapore to welcome us and to welcome our shelter. Um, and so we'll be having uh, tours as well organized by the students where they will be able to share more also what they've been doing. So from Saturday for four weeks at the National Design Center level two. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. If you have any other questions or comments, you can either direct message us. If you're too shy to put it in the public comments, we'll be able to direct you to the right person. I just noticed that Sophie from the Center for Canadian Architecture also just posted a comment. So uh, despite the time zone, she has actually joined us. So hi, Sophie. And thank you for actually allowing us to, to screen this documentary. And we look forward to more continued conversations on building an inclusive community in Singapore. Thank you.